Welcome back to our five-part series on evolution. In this part, part three, we're going to talk about speciation. Now, if you recall, in our last discussion on natural selection, with Darwin's ideas, we were able to explain how species could change over time. But we were left at the end of that video with a question. Where do new species come from? How do they arise? Well, it turns out that under certain conditions, the process of natural selection can lead to the creation of new species. We call that speciation. Now before we get too far along, we need to define a couple terms that are going to be useful. The first is species, a group of interbreeding individuals who can produce fertile offspring. We'll talk more about the concept of species in part four, uh, population genetics, but for now th that'll do. Uh, population, all the members of a given species in a given area. So that's a term we'll be using in this video and that we'll elaborate more in part four also. And finally, gene pool, the entire genetic content of a population. Uh, again, another term that we'll spend a lot more time in the next video, but we need to have these terms now because we'll use them at times throughout this video, and I just want you to be comfortable with those definitions. So the steps of speciation. If you could make a recipe for speciation, what would the ingredients be? Well, the first ingredient is reproductive isolation. What does that mean? We're going to create two distinct populations with no exchange of genes between the gene pools. In other words, no gene flow. I think this is best done with an example. So here's our uh, environment, let's say, and we're going to populate this environment with a, a made-up animal. We're going to call them whatchamacallit. So here's our population of whatchamacallit. It's, it's one species, one population. They're all one group. They interbreed and, and play around and, and run around and feed in this area. And one day while they're doing that, it's horrific, but there's an earthquake. And it opens up a canyon. Uh, a couple of these little whatchamacallits had to die as a result. Unfortunately, this guy just made it. But it divides our population of whatchamacallits into two populations. We have the, the A side over here, uh, population A, and population B. And they can't get across, they, they can't jump across, they can't go around. They are isolated from each other. They can no longer reproduce. We have two distinct populations. There's no gene flow. There's no sharing of genes between population A and population B. They are their own distinct gene pools now. Well, in our recipe for speciation, the next ingredient is time. Time. We're just going to wait. If we wait, we're going to get a, a, um, a phenomenon called divergence. Population A and population B are going to diverge from each other in a genetic fashion. They're going to be the accumulation of random genetic mutations over time. Mutations are going to happen over here in population A, and mutations are going to happen in population B, and since they're random, they're probably not going to be the same mutation. So over time, these two populations are going to start to look differently. The make of the gene pool is going to change. As more time passes, we get more genetic mutations and more differences between population A and population B, and even more. Now, sometime in the future, let's say that someone comes along and builds a bridge across the canyon to reintroduce population B and population A. And if, at that point, one of these guys comes across and tries to mate with someone in population A, if they can no longer mate and they can no longer make uh, fertile offspring, then by definition, they have become separate species. Speciation has occurred. So to recap, the steps for speciation, we need reproductive isolation, a restriction of gene flow between populations, and as a result, over time, we'll get a divergence, an accumulation of random genetic mutations over time, such that at some point in time, they become separate species. Let's take a closer look at reproductive isolation, because there are different types. Some of them we can group together as prezygotic, or prior to breeding reproductive isolation prior to breeding. Now the example I gave was a geographic isolation. There's a physical barrier and that's an easy one to understand. And so in my canyon in this case, but it could be a river or an ocean or a mountain range or you know depending on the species it could be a four-lane highway. It could be a geographic barrier isolation to reproduction prior to breeding. But we also have temporal isolations. Temporal means time. If two different groups mate at different times of the year, then they might as well be across the canyon from each other. They are isolated from a gene pool perspective. And what about behavioral isolations? 
restrictions due to courtship behaviors. In some species, there's very particular behaviors they have to engage in before they'll mate, and if they don't engage in the proper behaviors, they will never mate. Um, this helps species identify uh, others, uh, individuals of their species. Here these birds are doing a pretty interesting little dance and it's these, these behaviors that let the bird know that the other one is of their species and fit to mate with. Let's move on. Uh, how about mechanical isolation? This one's pretty concrete also. It's when parts just don't fit. When reproductive structures are incompatible, then again you might as well be on the other side of the mountain range. And we have gametic isolation. Maybe you can uh, you can mate, um, but before the zygote forms, the the gametes are not compatible. They won't combine. The sperm and egg uh, won't combine, and therefore uh, those species or those individuals are reproductively isolated from each other. Now sometimes you can mate, you can breed, you can a attempt to reproduce, but postzygotically you're still isolated, meaning after fertilization. For example. There's going to be a genetic incompatibility. The sperm and egg can fuse during fertilization, but as the chromosomes go to pair up, uh, they don't match. There's there's too much of a genetic difference, so you get unworkable hybrids. They just they don't work. And also, we can even have a hybrid formed. You can have a hybrid born, but the hybrid is sterile. And remember our definition for species: you have to be able to mate and produce fertile offspring. So if the hybrid can't reproduce, then again the two species are separated by that barrier. Now notice that some of these isolations don't require that the individuals are physically uh, separated from, from one another. In fact, most of them do not require a physical barrier between the groups. Well, this leads us to some interesting patterns or modes of speciation. And the first one we're going to look at is called allopatric. Allo meaning other, patric, patria, fatherland. So an allopatric speciation is going to look a lot like our our, well it is, our geographic isolation will lead to allopatric speciation. So some physical barrier forms in the population separating part of the population from the rest of the population. And then divergence occurs, they start to become different. Later if the barrier is removed like we did in our example, uh, you have two distinct species. So allopatric speciation is when speciation occurs at other places, uh, a physical geographic barrier. You can say geographic isolation leads to allopatric speciation. But what's more interesting is to look at the sympatric speciation. So here's your original population, sim meaning the same, patria, again fatherland, so same land. We're going to have uh, speciation occur without having to, to go anywhere, without having to split physically our, our group. So the initial step of speciation has to have some polymorphism occurring, so some change in the gene pool within the population but as a result, that group that has that polymorphism, that change, that new thing, can't uh, breed with the others in the group. And so over time, they'll uh, diverge and increase their numbers. And, uh, and what do I have here? Oh, there we go. And eventually, we have a new distinct species. So think about what could have led to that. Maybe a change in behavior for behavioral isolation or a temporal time reproducing at different times of the year. Any of those other isolating mechanisms, maybe a polyploidism where there was a genetic change such that it was so different that they, um, they could no longer breed with the others in the group. And eventually you have two distinct species in the same area due to that isolating event. So we have our sympatric speciation. But there's one more. It's called parapatric, para meaning alongside of. So in this case, what we have is in the first step is we have a new niche, a new niche entered. So in other words, part some new space opens up to the population and individuals can move into that space and take advantage of the resources there. And then because they're in that area, there's a divergence. The animals or organisms over here slowly start to change uh, genetically from the others in the group. And if enough time passes, that group alongside the other group forms a new species. So we have these different modes of selection, kind of different patterning of how we end up with different species. Well, how about the pattern of speciation. Those are modes, but how about pattern? Well, we can have a simple branching pattern where one species branches into two, and then those species might branch into you know other species over time. So we can have this branching pattern, and, and that happens a lot. But uh, a very common pattern of speciation that we want to look at uh, requires a little bit more work. 
So let's take a look at this. Let's say we have, here's our, our population, and this is their range of habitat, let's say. And so the population is going to grow, uh, and so we'll get more individuals in the population, and the population uh, may grow some more. And notice as the population grows, every once in a while we get a new variation pop up, a different version of the species, a slightly different um, physical characteristic, maybe. And if we have uh, even more population growth, the population is growing, uh, eventually though we're going to start to get some competition in here. There's only so many resources and as the population grows, resources become limited and competition increases. We also see that more variations pop up in the population over time. So think about what's going to happen. As the population size increases, competition increases, and there's more variation within the population. At some point, something's got to give. Let's think about these variations. Let's look at the guys that have variation B. What if variation B, whatever change that is in the population, whatever difference that those individuals have, allow them to move into a less competitive space, maybe a new niche, maybe it's a different food source or some other different resource that if you have uh, the B variation, you can take advantage of. Well, if you move over here, now you're in a less competitive arena and you have a better chance of being successful. And physically, if it's over here, why come back over here and compete with all these other guys? Well, if each of these groups and each of these differences could allow you to radiate out from the center and occupy a different niche, that would become advantageous. These differences, these variations, these adaptations allow the subgroups to radiate out. We call this pattern of speciation adaptive radiation. When one common ancestor gives rise to many distinct species. So again, under what conditions would this occur? Pause the video and write down the conditions that would be required for adaptive radiation to occur. What did you come up with? Well, you have to have a lot of competition. Competition is going to drive this move away from the competition. You have to have variations within the population. Some adaptations have to arise that allow for the exploitation of a new niche. And individuals will need to move out into those less competitive arenas and thrive. Over time, they'll diverge and eventually can become new species. Like I said, this is a very common pattern of speciation. It can explain the uh, radiation, uh, adaptive radiation of the marsupials in Australia, all the different groups that came from a common ancestor. And of course, it explains very famously Darwin's finches, the adaptive radiation of these subtle variations in beak shape, which allow the different groups of finches to feed on different food sources and therefore move into a less competitive uh, arena. Now, the last thing we have to discuss is the pace of evolution. Well, it's slow. It's evolution. Very seldom does it happen quickly. It takes many generations and lots of time for those genetic mutations to accumulate uh, for divergence to occur. So let's say we have a million years. And in a million years, we're going to change our species from here to here, from point A to point B. Well, it's going to be slow. It's a million years. But there's two ways to get from point A to point B. We could go this route a slow, continual, gradual chain over a million years. But we could also do this. We could have long periods of relative stability punctuated by relatively short bursts of change. Then long periods of stability, short bursts of change. Now, mind you, these short bursts is relative. This space from, from let me grab a pen, from you know here to here, that's still a long period of time because this scales a million years. But relative to these long stretches of stability, these are short bursts of change. So again, long stretches of stability, short bursts of change. So the white line we would say is a slow, continual, gradual evolution. And the yellow line is what we call punctuated equilibrium. These periods of equilibrium punctuated by change. And this pattern is supported by lots of evidence. The fossil record supports this. We see long periods where the fossils remain pretty consistent and then relatively short bursts of layers of rocks where there's lots of change. And also the geology and the atmospheric evidence support uh, that the environment on Earth has gone through these same patterns where we have the environment relatively stable for long periods and then again relatively short bursts of environmental change. And we'd expect that evolution would follow the same pattern as the environmental changes since it is the environment that drives evolution.
So that brings us to the end of section three on speciation. Uh, come back for section four where we talk about population genetics. If you have any questions, leave them for me in the comment section below the video and I hope you learned something.